happening? It's on in the back here. You guys can, it's good. <clears throat> well, we are continuing our journey through the book of Luke this morning, still in Luke chapter 1. And as we had said, Luke, Dr. Luke had written a detailed account of the life of Christ, and we've been methodically and thinking through what this account means so that we might have certainty in our faith. And this morning we're going to be looking at the account of the birth of John the Baptist leading the way to Christ. And so if you have your Bible today, I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 57 through 66. So we're going to turn our attention to the reading of God's Word. Verse 57 through to 66. We're going to get right to it this morning. Let's hear God's Word. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard him laid up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. This is the word of the Lord given for our church. It's given for our good. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we ask that you would take your word and you would do work on our hearts today. That you would conform us, that you would transform us, that you would mold us more into the likeness of Christ through your word, that we might better reflect your image that we might better know the sin that dulls our hearts and causes us to wander from you, but more than that, we might know your great grace that leads us to your mercy, your salvation, and that we would proclaim this great grace wherever you might have us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, not too long ago, I found myself watching a documentary called The Rescue. I'm not sure if anybody has seen this documentary. It, it chronicles this, this riveting story of the Thai cave rescue. And as I found myself watching it, of this junior football team trapped in a cave for 18 days, at every corner, sitting on the edge of my seat, wondering, what, what is going to happen next? How is this rescue going to ensue? How... Well, what is going to turn out from this story? Almost as if I was holding my breath at some points in the story, thinking, this is unbelievable. If you've seen it, maybe you can agree to that sentiment. What is, what is going to happen next? Could barely handle the suspense in the story. In our passage this morning, if, you've, if, you, if your eyes were glancing over what we had read, there's a similar gasping or suspense that is happening in God's people in the crowds, wondering what is God up to? What is going to happen next? What is God about to do in human history? And Luke wants to leave no room for questioning in this account that what God is up to is displaying His mercy and fulfilling His promises for His people. What God is up to is fulfilling His covenant, His promises for His people. And the result of God fulfilling His promises, the result of this great mercy that God is doing at this point in human history uh, results in three significant responses that we're going to see this morning. Joy, one of faith, and one of awe. The response of God fulfilling His promise brings these three responses, one of joy, one of faith, and one of awe. And so, in verse 57 and 58, we find how the mercy of God leads to this response of great joy. It's important to set the stage, the context, and going back a few verses, we 
We studied uh, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth only a few weeks ago, but they were a despondent couple. Old in years, we learned that Elizabeth was barren. We also learned that they were living a good Jewish life. Elizabeth was a daughter of Aaron in that lineage, and Zechariah would have been known in his community as one who had a, a, a good title, a title to be sought after as, the, as a priest, and yet the thing that they wanted most in their life, the thing that they desired more than anything else was a child, and yet they weren't able to have this child. Again, Elizabeth was barren, and you can imagine, especially, well, you could imagine in our culture today, but you can imagine even then that to not be able to have a child would have brought great shame upon you. You can imagine the anger that they might have experienced over the years, the societal reaction from other people because of the circumstances they were in, and maybe even at times as they were together wondering and questioning, are we under God's curse? What is God doing to us? Is there something wrong with us? Surely they were in a low place. And it's in the very middle of this that God shows up on the scene, where God enters into human history and He makes them a series of promises. And He says to them, there's, there, there's many promises that He makes to them, but He says, you will have a son, you will name him John, that the people will rejoice. And it's not going to be because of your credentials. It's not going to be because of your heritage. It's not going to be because of the great title that you may have amongst your neighborhood. No, it's not going to be any of these reasons. The reason that you're going to have this child is going to be because of the sheer mercy of God. It's going to be the mercy of God that you are going to have a son. In fact, this is is a familiar scene that ought to conjure up in our minds of how God has worked through the entire scriptural story of women who are barren, when times are hopeless, when their backs are against the wall, where God comes to them and he extends his covenantal love. He operates in a way where only God could do this, where God comes on the scene and and extends this mercy. And so we see the response in verse 58, the relatives who would have come from far, the neighbors in their community, they heard. This fulfillment had happened and they heard that the Lord had shown great mercy Great mercy to Elizabeth, and they rejoiced with her. First Mary, as we had studied last week in the Magnificat, how she magnified the Lord, how God had given His mercy to His covenant people. Now as Elizabeth, rejoicing in the mercy of God among her neighbors, next week we'll see in Zechariah's song, in him praising and wondering at the tender mercy of the Lord, expressing the mercy of God. Now this idea of mercy speaks to, as I've alluded to just a few moments ago, the steadfast love of God. It speaks to His fierce loyalty to His people, His covenant love towards His people. In fact, if you look and study this word has said in the Old Testament, this, this word that speaks of the loving kindness of God, The steadfast love of God, you can find it on almost every page, especially of the Psalms, but hundreds of times where God shows up to a people undeserving. A people who are in need of this covenantal love, a desperate people like Zechariah, like Elizabeth, like us. Much like the gospel comes to us as we read this morning in Ephesians, to an undeserving people, when mercy comes to us, We have no response but rejoicing. We were once dead people walking in our sins, in our trespasses, walking far from God, children of wrath. And God comes to us and bestows a mercy upon us. He raises us up with Christ, one who is rich in mercy. And so we rejoice. The crowd surrounding the birth Rejoice with Elizabeth because God had made good on his promise. 
He come on the scene and demonstrated a great mercy in the birth of this baby. And when God puts his mercy on display in the lives of these people, in our lives, there is great joy. We respond with something that only God could have done. And you know, as Christians, I think there's something instructive of what we learn in this story. Is that we're very well trained in recognizing the things that aren't happening in our lives. The things that we can complain about and and wallow in. And yet as we see this rejoicing when God is at work, rejoicing in the mercy of God, that we can be instructed as the community of God's people to live and to learn and to praise God and allow the root of our joy to be rooted in His provision and goodness to us. And what He has given to us, a great salvation, the many gifts that God has given to each and every one of us, and we share in it. And so when you pray, when you sit around the table with fellow believers, and you come together with God's people, share in the work and the mercy that God has given to us that we might find more and more reason to rejoice and be glad in what He has done for us. The first thing we see is a response of joy in light of God's mercy. We also see a a response of humble faith in the story. A response of humble faith. The eighth day comes as we read and it's, it's time for any Jewish parent, any good Jewish parent to give their child, to give their son the covenant sign of circumcision. And the tradition had grown that it was also time when the child would be named at this time as well. Now, naming in Scripture is done for a host of reasons. There's many reasons that come around this notion of why a child is named. For some, it's because of the given circumstances of the child's birth. For others, it could be upon the child's appearance or based upon their parent's name. Maybe it's the the sheer joy of the situation But I think what we see here is that the the naming of this child is based on the couple's own faith in God's promise and character. That the name given to Zechariah and Elizabeth to name this child was something that would reflect about God, about his character, of what God had promised to them. And so we see this wonderful situation going on where the neighbors are gathering around and they're saying, what, are you, are you going to name this child after your father, after Zechariah? And Elizabeth, she promptly responds and says, no, his name is going to be John. John is going to be his name. And I don't know if you, can, if you could take license to imagine what is happening in that culture or even in our day and age when all your family members are saying, why would you name him why would you name him John? We don't have any relatives. This seems bizarre and strange. Maybe like other family members who might chime in and say, why would you, why would you name your child that? Maybe nobody in your family is that forthright, but I'm sure there's some out there. And Elizabeth is saying, no, his name will be John. And so they say, well, clearly this isn't enough here. And they go to Zechariah. And they begin to have this form of charades with him. They're they're making signs to him. Now, if you remember from the story, Zechariah was under discipline for not believing the promise of God. And he presumably is at least mute, but maybe mute and deaf here because he doesn't understand. They're making signs to him. And so he takes this tablet that he'd been writing on for probably the past nine months since he had been mute and he emphatically he emphatically writes down in confirmation with what Elizabeth said in conf- confirmation what Gabriel had revealed to him his name is John in fact if you read in the original language it reads as John is his name what we need to see here in the story is that both Zechariah and Elizabeth were responding by faith Responding by faith to the promise of God. God had promised a son to them. And not only a son, but a son whose name would be John. And here's what's interesting about this. The name John means that God is gracious. God is gracious. That their son, John the Baptist, his name would showcase God's 
this grace for the remainder of his life. You remember, impossible situation, barren couple, not going to have a child. God's promise comes true and they respond in faith. His name would be John. This unmerited favor given to this little couple in Palestine would tell of God's grace for the rest of their life and in John the Baptist. It's marking of grace upon their lives, marking of, of grace upon this child's life. And how did they respond? The relatives, the family members, we read in our passage that they wondered at this. They wondered at this. I'm sure that they were wondering at the, the sheer unity of Zechariah and Elizabeth, their faith and response to God's promise, but they were also wondering in the unique way that this name, this, the, this, this child would be named after the character and, and providence of God. They wondered at it. And I think it's an appropriate question to ask today as we think about people wondering and, and pondering the grace of God. When is the last time you found yourself wondering at something that God has done? Wondering at the grace of God in your life. Pondering His grace to you that you're redeemed. That God sent Jesus to die for you. That He adopts us into His family. That daily He is conforming us to His image, sanctifying us. That one day He would glorify us. With him, they responded in wondering, what is God doing here? And Zechariah and Elizabeth respond in a humble, beautiful faith. So we see a response of joy in light of the mercy of God. We see this beautiful response of faith to the promises of God, and the, and the people wondered at it. We also see a response of awe in verses 64 through 66. Let me read it here. After this, after the naming of the son, they wondered, and immediately Zechariah, his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard him laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with them. You have to remember, as I alluded to, Zechariah hadn't spoken in months. He was disciplined for doubting God's promise to him. Gabriel told him that you will be silent and you will not speak because you didn't believe. But there was more than that. There was a promise that was, that was laden in this discipline as well that you will not be able to speak until these things take place. Until the birth of John happens. There was a promise with this discipline. You wonder, what, how was Zechariah to, to deal with this? What was he to do with this promise, with this discipline? You, it could have been very reasonable, if you were to think, that Zechariah, through this period of time, the posture of his heart could have been angry towards God. You know, it seems that this is an unbelievable thing to, to believe in my, in my life. Why would God do this to me? Or... He could submit to God's plan. He could believe and obey and trust that God's providence, that God's work in his life is true. And he reflected upon this for nine months in repentance and reflection and thinking through what God was truly doing. To submit to God or to become angry with God's discipline towards him. And really, this is the choice that we have in all of our lives. When God operates in ways that we don't understand, when there's discipline that is happening in our lives, when there's things that we can't fathom or understand, do we bail on God? Do we become angry with Him? When hardships come our way, do we become offended at the ways in which God might work in our lives? Or, through sometimes the deepest possible pain, do we believe him at his word? Do we trust him? Do we say, God, I don't understand why you might be doing this, but I know that your providence in goodness is true. It's easy to think that God might be far and aloof 
and call to you when, when times of hardship come. But Zechariah, he gives this, this wonderful example of enduring hardship as a son endures the discipline of his father. He remains patient. He endures. We see the transformation that happens in his heart because when the time came, when the child was born, he emphatically says his name will be John and immediately he begins to praise God. Immediately he begins to glorify God. He's not filled with offense anymore. He recognizes the provision, the goodness, the mercy of God and and he praises him. What a beautiful change of a of a, a unbelieving heart to one who's trusting, who's relying, who is glorifying God. And it wasn't only Zechariah who responded with this praise, but everyone around them became amazed at what they saw. Fear fell on many and, and the word spread throughout the surrounding region. It amazes me how one man's faithful obedience to God's word, trusting in God, could allow people to begin to talk about God's mercy. People began to ponder what was going on, what God had in store, what will this child to, to be? It got the people talking. They said, what will this child be? Now you and I, we know the rest of the story. We know that John the Baptist would, for 30 years, uh, 30 years later, that he would have a public ministry that would be a forerunner for the life of Christ, that he would be a voice crying in the wilderness. But they didn't know this. They were wondering, what is this child going to be? These are improbable circumstances. It seems that the hand of the Lord is at work here. What is God going to do in the life of this child? They had to wait. 30 years, we don't even know if Zechariah and Elizabeth got to see the fruition of the promise given to their own child. You can imagine for the years ahead, people wondering as John the Baptist is out in the wilderness, clothed in animal fur, being a man living in the wilderness, thinking, is this really what God's promise? Is this really the, the fulfillment of what God's promise was to be for him? Is God still making true on his promise? Is this really the guy? Is this really the man who is going to usher in our Savior and Lord? I can imagine at times there was great doubt, hard to believe what God might have been doing in the life of this child. You see, it's easy for us to doubt the promises of God. It's hard to believe how God might be working and fulfilling his plans in our lives, in the plan of this story here through John the Baptist. Listen to what Kelvin said in his commentary of actually reflecting on this verse. He said, For while trifling and frivolous occurrences remain firmly in our minds, things things that that are trifling, worrisome, those who ought to produce a constant recollection of divine grace immediately fade and disappear. It seems that the trifling, the, the things that are hard to believe seem to cling to our minds and the things that should stay in our minds, grace in favor of how God has worked, seem to so quickly fade and disappear in our lives. Doesn't that ring true for you today? I know it rings true of my mind of how quickly I can forget God's word, how quickly I can forget God's promises. And so like the people of that day, we need to ponder the promises of God. We now need to allow them to work its place in our heart to know that when we confess our sins to Him, that we are forgiven. It's a promise that God promises that we have assurance from our sins, that we, the work that He started in us, that He is faithful to complete it. That He's promised that we will be glorified, as we had spoke earlier, uh, with Him and have a resurrection He's promised us a new heavens and a new earth. He's promised for the believer that all things work for good for those who love him. He's promised that one day he will wipe away every tear and all sorrow in this world. He's promised to us that he will be a good covenant father to us and to our children. That he's a God who will never leave you or forsake you. These are the things that God has promised to us in His Word. And we need to ponder, to think about it, 
to trust. As someone once said, sometimes we need to be silenced so that we may hold them, these promises, even dearer in our own hearts. We need to endure discipline in our lives that we might search these promises out like Zechariah did, that we might cling to them ever more dearly, that we might respond in faith and trust and awe to him. Listen, the truth of this story and the truth for you and I today is that God always brings his promises to pass. He did then and he will continue to do this for his people. And so when we read a story like this this morning, can we respond in joy that God, the same God that was working then, is working in the life of his church. He's working in the life of us today. We can respond in joy. We respond in simple faith and obedience to God's word, as difficult as it may be in our lives. Respond in a, in a growing awe as we ponder his promises in our hearts today. Let's pray. Lord, we pray, as difficult as it might be with our circumstances around us, the challenges and difficulties, the weariness, sometimes the lethargy of our own heart, to lose sight of your good graces to us, to lose sight of your promises, to lose sight of the great Savior that you are to us, and we cling to frivolous, trifling things that seem to weigh in our minds and our hearts. And we ask today, even as we go to the table now, that you, re- you might remind us, remind us of your promises, remind us of your perfect life that you lived, the death that you died in our place, rising from the grave and now praying for us one day that we will be with you in an unhindered fellowship forever. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.